silence caught our eyes. Handgun judgment in Kabir and another and Secretary of State for the Home Department. Uh, for the reasons given in the judgments tonight, I now hand down on behalf of the Vice President, Lord Justice Haddon Cave and myself. The appeal in this case is dismissed. The appellant shall pay the respondent's reasonable cost to be assessed if not agreed. There has been no application for permission to appeal uh, uh, to the Supreme Court. I'll just sign that order. of Keystone Healthcare Limited and another, and Parr and others. Yes, Mr. Next. My Lord, I appear on behalf of the appellant. Yes. My learned friend, Mr. Budworth, appears on behalf of the respondents. My Lord, before embarking upon the substance of the appeal, there is an application by the respondents dated the 26th of March to incorporate two documents into the bundle. Uh, has my Lord got a copy of that application? Yes. <coughs> my Lord, that application is opposed. Shall I set out the basis of the opposition? I'm not aware of it myself. I'm sorry, my Lord. Uh, in support of the application is a very short witness statement. We've got a witness statement from Miss Hussein, and what she wants to... Um, show us is uh, a judgment of the Chancellor giving summary judgment for the um, the amount that was stolen from the company and a witness statement by Mr Ward. My Lord, yes. And speaking for myself, I can't at the moment see why we need to refer to them. Well, my Lord, that is our position. They're unnecessary to the issues in dispute in this appeal. And secondly, they're not in accordance with the practice direction, which is clearly designed to keep bundles as concise as possible. Yeah. Let's ask Mr. Bugworth. Why, why do we need these documents, Mr. Bugworth? The application was made on the basis that the skeleton argument expressly refers to both documents, and in respect of the Chancellor's judgment. Well, the judge refers to the Chancellor's judgment. I mean, we know yes, it, but it's only in passing, and so yeah. the, the judge says very little about the payroll fraud, so it was thought important at least that your Lordships had access to the summary judgment if it was felt necessary. And it may be for one reason, because um, it's the summary judgment that charts the chronology of the payroll fraud, and of course that allows us to make the point that the misconduct started before holdings had been incorporated, yeah. because that point of timing may be significant. In respect of the witness statement, it was simply that the witness statement was the, was the source of the evidence that holdings was incorporated as a matter of transactional necessity, or at least everybody below was prepared to proceed said, on that. The effect. judge said so. Yes. But the foundation for it was in the witness statement. Again, because it had been referred to, we thought it ought to be available. Well, you can refer to the Vice Chancellor's judgment if you want to. Uh, sorry, the Chancellor's judgment if you want to, as a reported case to see the case. Yes, it was. It if was. That's relevant. It, it was simply a matter of. Any, as an authority, if necessary. I suppose so. We we thought it. Because they've been mentioned, if there was a need to turn to them, at least they were there. But I, I, there's no great substance to the application. No. All right, well, let's, let's get on with the appeal. Thank you, my Lord. You can take it, um, Mr Mason, that we have read the relevant parts of the judge's judgment and we have read the skeleton arguments. Thank you very much. Then, my Lord, the appellant appeals against paragraph one of his honour judge, Stephen Davis, yeah. sitting as a High Court judge, dated the 18th of June of 2018. He appeals with my Lord's permission granted on the 2nd of November of 2018. It relates to what is effectively referred to both within the judgment and throughout the papers as the overpayment claim yes. and amounts to some £650,000. My Lord, the overpayment claim arises out of the appellant's sale of his shares in the shareholding yeah, in the we, firm. We, we know all that. Thank you. My Lord, at the, 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 the point is that the judge said that had the payroll fraud been brought to light, uh, then the bad lever provisions would have applied and um, your client would have got half the value of his shares rather than their value. My Lord, that 
that's correct, and we say that he erred in that respect yes. and the way in which he did it. But my Lord, can I submit that at the heart of this claim, and accordingly the appeal, is firstly the appellant's relationship with the first respondents, namely health care, and if I refer to them as that. But secondly, and more importantly, the existence of any relationship between the appellant and the second respondents, namely holdings, beyond a contractual relationship relating to the sale of the shares. Mm. And following on from that, if there is a relationship, the nature of that relationship, and thus the duties and obligations of any such relationship. My Lord, a skeletal background to the sale is to be found in paragraphs 2 and 3 of the appellant skeleton argument. I don't propose to rehearse those. Mm -hmm. What I do say is significant is the share purchase agreement itself. Uh, and my Lord, that is to be found at tab 18, page 186 in your bundle. Sorry, 176. Yep. My Lord, the first point to note is that that agreement to purchase shares by the holding company does not relate simply to the appellant but related to the other two shareholders in health care namely Mr. Richard Ward and his wife Helen Ward my lord in so far as health care is concerned if I could invite you to turn over to page 177. Yeah. Healthcare is not a party to the agreement. It is simply referred to by reference in the interpretation of the body as the company. And that can be seen approximately a third of the way down the page. Yes. My Lord, there are two other significant provisions in the context of this claim and this appeal. And that relates to third party rights and the assignment of the agreement. If I could invite my Lord to turn, please, to page 182. At the foot of the page, under clause 15. There's a heading, third party rights, which states very briefly that no one other than a party to this agreement, their successors or permitted assignees, shall have any right to enforce any of its terms. Yeah. And then turning please back to page 181. Clause 8, headed assignment. Yes. It's a provision that it is personal to the parties, limits the circumstances of assignment which do not apply, we submit in this case. No. But I don't think they don't think that Keystone is trying to enforce this contract. My Lord, no, but what is significant in relation to it? is that that share agreement is what we say is that the only regulation of any relationship mm. between the appellant and the holding company, who are the company, in fact, that the claim suggests sustained a loss. Yes. That would be a claim of loss matter. My Lord, yes. My Lord, what is also significant is that on the date that the appellant agreed to sell his shares, he gave notice of his resignation as a director of health care, effective from the next board meeting. A copy of that document is at tab 20, page 196. 
Sorry? Tab 20, if you say. Tab, yeah. tab 20, my lord, at page 196. That's on the same day as the agreement. And when was the board meeting at which the letter was to be presented? It's not clear, my lord, that reading the judgment, effectively the learned judge took the two to be effectively contemporaneous. You better just show us that. If one turns, please, to paragraph 155, page 65, turning over to page 166. He deals with it in relation to the issue of de facto director. You say that this paragraph 156 contains a finding about the date of the board meeting? Sorry, no, no, my lord. Perhaps I didn't uh, express myself very clearly. It, it's the way that he treats it as effectively that the two are contemporaneous with one another. He doesn't actually refer to the date of the board meeting. He well, the resignation is expressed to take effect from the conclusion of the board meeting at which this letter is presented. So it's not an immediate resignation. It's going to take effect, I would assume, on some future date when the board meeting takes place. That is the effect of that particular provision. Right. Do, do we know when the board meeting took place? I'm not aware that it is within the papers. Would you excuse my back for one moment, Mike? No, my lord, there's no uh, precision as to the particular right. date. But I think the effect of how the judge treated it is that effectively <clears throat> they occurred, if not together, within a very short space of time. Right. It's clearly important in two respects. Firstly, in the respect of clearly the fiduciary duties that the appellant would owe to the uh, health care. And secondly, it's important in the relationship or alleged relationship uh, between him and Holdings. Between which, him and Holdings? Yes, yeah. which my learned friend seeks to place reliance upon as giving rise to some continuing existing fiduciary relationship. Again, if one looks a little further, there's clearly, a, I would submit, a link in the judge's mind in, in paragraph 156, because the learned judge refers to the relationship between Mr. Parr on the one hand as a departing shareholder and holdings on the other as an incoming shareholder. And then goes on to make reference to the existence of a fiduciary relationship. Well, the judge is rejecting 
the argument that Mr. Parr owed a fiduciary duty to holdings. My Lord, he is. And he's rejecting the argument that there was a fiduciary relationship between Mr. Parr and Mr. and Mrs. Ward. My Lord, he is. And those are important matters. Yeah. Uh, if I can turn and identify then a number of findings of the judge mm. that I submit a material to your determination of the appeal, not simply in respect of those matters that are the subject of the appellant's grounds of appeal, but are also relevant uh, to the three different or additional grounds uh, that the respondents seek to uphold. Uh, my Lord, those are identified at tab 11 at page 105. Yeah. Well, why don't you present your appeal first, and uh, you can respond to uh, Mr. Uh, Budworth's respondent's notice. Well, my Lord, I'm content to deal with that. The, the only reason I introduce it in this way mm -hmm. is that the question of the fiduciary relationship, if it doesn't exist on the basis of Mr. Parr's actual position, then it logically follows the argument of whether or not he's a de facto director. Because if I negate both of those arguments and undermine the existence of any fiduciary relationship, then other submissions logically flow on from that. So. That is how, subject to any views of my lords, I was proposing to deal with that particular matter. The, well, number of the, judge, the, the judge's judgment is based on his conclusion that there was a fiduciary relationship between Mr. Parr on the one hand and Keystone Healthcare on the other. Yes. It is not based on any fiduciary relationship between Mr. Parr and Holdings or Mr. Parr and Mr. and Mrs. Ward. My Lord, that is so correct. Your task is to show us why the judge was wrong in basing his decision on what he thought was a fiduciary relationship between Mr. Parr and Keystone Healthcare. My Lord, a, a number of the considerations that arise out of those facts that I say that the judge found are relevant to the relationship between, or alleged relationship between, Mr. Parr and uh, Holdings and Healthcare. But secondly, and, and in particular, it's relevant to the applicability of the so-called um, departure discount. I'm, I'm sorry. Mr. Mason, I'm not following this. In, in answer to my Lord's question, are you saying that there was no fiduciary duty owed by Mr. Parr to health care, or that there was, but it doesn't matter? No, my Lord, I say that there was, clearly insofar as that duty continued, it was clearly an important consideration. <coughs> In so far as the judge's decision is concerned, effectively the decision to provide there being disgorgement of profit is predicated upon the applicability of the 50% discount. It's the appellant's case that that particular provision did not apply because of the absence of any fiduciary relationship to the holding company in any event. So if that was the case, there are no circumstances in which the holding company could ever have availed themselves of that discount. My Lord. I'll go through the provisions, if I may, shortly in a moment. But 
can I identify very briefly a number of relevant facts that I say are important to the determination of the appeal, including to that particular issue. I won't at this stage go through the findings of fact that by which the learned judge dismissed the alternative bases advanced by the respondents uh, and which are contained within the respondent's notice. Uh, I'll deal with those in due course when I get to the submissions relating to them. But there is one particular finding that is important with regard to the circumstances in which there was a decision. It's referred to by Mr. Walt, effectively doing it through the medium of the holding company to acquire at the price that he did. You will have noted at paragraph 61 of the particulars of claim, which is at tab 14, and paragraph 50 of my learned friend's skeleton argument, that effectively it is asserted that Mr. Ward was willing to pay a substantial premium effectively to get uh, the appellant out of the company. That clearly, in my submission, is not in accordance with the judge's findings. Because if I invite you please to turn to paragraph 197 of the judgment. Yes. There's reference to the argument that's effectively uh, contained within those two documents I referred my lords to. Then at page 100, uh, sorry, paragraph 197, I am not satisfied that Mr. Ward would have been prepared to pay whatever Mr. Parr asked unless he believed that it bore some general resemblance to the market value. Yeah. And then he goes on to explain why he came to that conclusion. Right. And for Mr. Ward we read holdings. My Lord, effectively yes, yeah. because that was the vehicle in which yes. it was being right. done through. So in my submission, based upon the judge's finding, he considered that what was being paid by holdings represented effectively a commercial decision rather than a decision influenced by simply a desire to extricate Mr. Parr from the company. So my lord, what the court was faced with was a primary case advanced upon the basis that so far as the overpayment claim was concerned, it was a claim for loss occasioned by, initially it was on the basis it was the healthcare, the first respondents, but subsequently an amendment made it that it, it was a loss sustained by the second respondents, holdings. So effectively, the loss was theirs. Mm. 
and the way in which the claim was formulated in paragraph 7 of the prayer. I thought pleading points had gone, the judge said. It's not, it's not a pleading point, my lord. It's, it's, um, it, it's on the basis of how, in fact, the claim was put and the nature of the relationship, because it's a reference to their claim damages for breach of fiduciary duty in yes. relation to the monies paid by holdings in respect of the appellant shares. But it, doesn't the judge deal with that at paragraph 152? He says it is pleaded as a claim, only as a claim for damages for breach of fiduciary duty, and strictly speaking there needs to be an amendment. But he's satisfied that no amendment is necessary, but if wrong, there's no possible objection. My Lord, that is, that is clearly correct, and the appellant has not submitted that the judge was wrong in considering other bases. Right. Our submission is he simply considered that basis incorrectly. Yes. Well, that, that's why I'd like you to explain to us where he went wrong. Well, my Lord, there is a fact that underpins the two different bases but that is important, and that is the applicability of the uh, lever provision mm -hmm. at a discount. My Lord, can I take you very briefly to the provisions themselves? And if I take you to clause 10.2 of the shareholder agreement at tab 17, page obligatory transfer event, it refers to the fact that if an obligatory transfer event occurs, then the discount provision overleaf 10 to applies, which makes reference to the articles. But then if one turns Back to the articles themselves, which are in tab 16, page 157. One can see reference to if a compulsory transfer occurs. Yes. And then the mechanism by what happens, and then at page 159, 18.6 is the discount provision. What is then important is that if that is triggered, The circumstances of what happens to the shares are set out within clause 18.10 to 13, overleaf of page 160. Yes. They, they've got to be offered to the company first. M my lord, they have, but it's significantly. At 18.11, uh, there is a provision relating to the company not accepting the offer unless the purchase is permitted by the Act. Yeah, what well, the judge found is it would have been permitted by the Act. My Lord, I don't think he actually did find that. What I understand his findings were 
he made reference to the fact, I think, on two occasions, that clearly a company is restricted. I thought he said that the company had well sufficient profits and dividend availability to enable such purchase to be made. Well, at paragraph 146, he says that nobody suggested that the in this hypothetical scenario, Keystone might not have acquired the shares. That's what I'm thinking. I don't remember better than I did. So it, was, it wasn't argued before the judge that there was any impediment to Keystone acquiring the shares. My Lord? Are you now suggesting that there is such an impediment? And if so, is it in your grounds of appeal? Well, it, it's not in the grounds of appeal, but what I submit is, is that in that paragraph, the learned judge does not go as far as saying that they would have been entitled to do so. He simply refers to the general prohibition, except if there is an exception. What he then goes on to say is in relation to holding. Neither party has suggested that this hypothetical scenario, Keystone might not have acquired the shares. Mm. Well, in my submission, he doesn't differentiate between the two. Clearly, there is no difficulty in terms of holdings acquiring the shares. Well, do, do you, I'm, I'm not following this. The, the judge, as it seems to me, is really quite careful to distinguish throughout the judgment between Keystone on the one hand and Holdings on the other. What he says in paragraph 146 is that nobody suggests that Keystone might not have acquired the shares, and that must be under Article 18.10. Are you saying that there is a reason which would have precluded Keystone from acquiring the shares? If so, where is it in your grounds of appeal? Well, what I'm submitting is it is not clear... Whilst the judge is clearly referring to the fact that they would have sought to acquire the shares, in my submission it's an entirely different question as to whether or not they will have been permitted to have acquired the shares. And that's not a matter that was simply considered. Well, I mean, apart from, let's take it at face value, I mean, the last sentence of that paragraph which my Lord referred at 146 uh, is the passage I was thinking of where the judge said it's plain from the accounts of the year ending March 2015 that substantial dividends were paid out that year so it's not self-evidently impossible that it could not have been done that's what I was remembering uh, so <laughs> on, on the premise that uh, there was some pro uh, uh, um, hypothetical problem there was no suggestion that it wasn't going to be impossible no I think that accurately summarises the position. If, if, if the, the Companies Act somehow prohibited Eastern Healthcare from acquiring the shares, couldn't have holdings, couldn't holdings have acquired the shares under clause 18.12? I, I don't see where this is. No, my lord, uh, with respect, they couldn't, because at the time that provision would have been triggered, the earliest wrongdoing was, in fact, in 2012, or even if it was 2014, they could not have triggered that provision, because they are not within that. Yeah. It's offered to holders of equity shares. Yeah, that's what the judge says at 146. Keystone would have had the first option to acquire the shares, and Mr and Mrs Ward would have had the second. My Lord, yes. And that's an accurate summary, is it not, of clauses, articles 18.10 and 18.12? It is, my Lord, and the significant point is that whilst they may have had the opportunity, the one entity that would not have had the opportunity was in fact holding. Yes, all right.
accept that. So, my lord, applying that, there are no circumstances in which Keystone Holdings could have ever benefited from that provision. Right. Let's accept that. So what? Well, my Lord, it, it gives rise to certain difficulties in the sense that so far as the shareholders agreement is concerned for the sale of the shares, that I submit is simply defined by normal contractual principles. As the second claimants were not a party to it, they can't rely upon the provisions within it. So that's the starting point. Oh, wait a minute. Second claimants, I... Sorry, the second respondents, yeah. holdings. I do yeah. apologize. No, it? Holdings can rely on the contract. It's Keystone Healthcare that can't because it's not a party to it. Sorry, my lord, we're at cross purposes. I thought I referred to the shareholders' agreement. Oh, I see. Sorry, uh, then we are at cross purposes. Yes, I, I, I can see that, but um, the companies can't rely on the shareholders' agreement. Yeah. The second point is that the articles of association relate to the company, which, in that context, is healthcare. Yeah. So again, in my submission. Holdings don't fall within the ambit of any of the provisions contained therein. Right. The third point is one we've already touched upon, that in any event, Article 18.13 does not apply because they're not members of the company at the relevant time. Right. So for all of those reasons, they were not entitled to the discount. They meaning holdings. Meaning holdings. Yeah. Right, right. Let's, let's accept that. Holdings are not entitled to the discount. Fine. And what that, my Lord, I submit translates to is that clearly the judge did not consider that he could find for either of the respondents, healthcare or holders, on the basis of their primary case, no. namely a claim for damages mm -hmm. in respect of the so-called overpayment. Yeah. The judge then did conclude that there was a liability to disgorge the profit which he found to be the difference between the price that was paid for the shares by the second respondent and the discounted price yeah. upon a compulsory transfer pursuant to the share agreement and the articles of association. So clearly that is a reference to a profit. It's alleged overpayment that the appellant received in respect of what is clearly a transaction relating to the holding company, namely the second respondent. Mm. 
but isn't it more accurate to say that um, what is required to disgorge is the benefit that he would obtain through not being made subject to the uh, uh, bad legal provisions under the Articles? The fact that he was ultimately structured in some different way for convenience of sake matters not for these purposes. The problem was that he wasn't subjected to that because no one at the time realised that they could have invoked them. Well, my Lord, with regard to disgorgement, in my submission, it clearly doesn't arise simply by operation of loss being caused. It operates clearly on the premise that there is some, in this case, fiduciary relationship between them. It's, it, it simply between whom? Well, it needs to be between the appellant yeah. and whoever the disgorgement is in relation to. Yeah, well, that's healthcare, not holdings. But, but healthcare, in my submission, this is where one runs into contradictions, has suffered no loss in relation to that transaction, and therefore in respect of healthcare, who are the relevant entity, the appellant is not in breach of a fiduciary duty in relation to... It doesn't to matter that the, that the person to whom the duty is owed hasn't suffered a loss or couldn't have acquired the benefit. I mean, if you go right back to Keach and Sanford, which is where this principle starts in the 18th century, the trustee uh, renewed a lease, uh, the landlord having said he would not renew the lease to the beneficiaries. The, the trustee holds the lease on trust. Or Boardman and Phipps. Mr Boardman acquires shares in a company uh, which the trust couldn't afford to acquire, didn't want to acquire, but he still held them on trust for the company as a secret profit, or as an unauthorised profit rather. But in my submission, this is a different situation. Right. Because insofar as the appellant had a fiduciary relationship, it was in respect of health care. It's quite interesting, and I say significant, that in relation to this particular issue, that the learned judge used the words alleged overpayment in respect of it. If I can take my Lord's it's paragraph 144. 144? I think so, my Lord, yes. where he sets out the analysis, which clearly is the starting point for the fact that in terms of an overpayment claim, in terms of loss, it effectively it was unsustainable. say the judge goes wrong? At what point? Well, well, in my submission, there could be no disgorgement of profits to a party that there was no relationship with the appellate. But there, there hasn't been. The judge's order was an order in favour of health care, not holdings. It is, but underlying that is the fact that 
it's predicated upon the basis that that may be handed over to holdings. Well, what holdings, what uh, healthcare chooses to do with its money is up to it. But in my submission, that gives rise to a situation that effectively the judge is doing something that he cannot do in the ordinary way of doing things. So the submission is, this is it, that in substance the judge gave judgment for a loss suffered by holdings, although Mr Parr owed holdings no fiduciary duty. Is yes. that what it comes to? Yes, and by reason of the way in which the articles and the shareholders' agreements are formulated, they could not have recovered mm. from him. Yeah. The one illustration as to the way in which the judge approached it, if I can refer you to paragraph 26 of my learned friend's skeleton argument, I think it's at tab 12, page 112. States, the judge held that Mr. Parr must therefore disgorge to Keystone, and Keystone then may pay over to holding as appropriate internally. And there's a reference to paragraph 151 because there is a sufficient nexus between the profit and the breach of duty. My Lord, if one looks at paragraph 151 of the judgment, in my submission, the judge doesn't in fact expressly say that. That is the case, particularly if you look at it in conjunction with the order itself. Yeah. The judge simply, in my submission, does not deal with the point relating to causation or nexus, whichever approach is adopted. my submission, there clearly has to be a causative link or nexus between the two. Between what? Between the breach of fiduciary duty and the profit yeah. or alternatively loss. to the decision of or judgment of Lord Justice Jonathan Parker in Murad at tab 7 in volume 1 of the appeal one. Can I ask who was responsible for preparing the authorities bundle? Could you tell me, please, why, for instance, we are given a handed-down transcript of Bristol and Matthew when it's reported in the Chancery Reports? Uh, why do we have um, a handed-down judgment in Attorney General and Blake when it's reported in the appeal cases? Uh, why do we have 449 pages of ultra-frame and fielding when only about three pages are relevant? My Lord, 
confirmation of my instructions came at a very late stage and there was a very little time in which to compile it. It was compiled in a way that was hopefully accessible, legible, but I do apologise for it. All right, well you want us to look at tab 7. One five seven. In my submission there, the learned judge clearly links the reference to the transaction which involved the breach of duty is important for the fiduciaries liable to account only for profits which he has made within the scope and ambit of that duty. Or may conflict with his personal interest. So in my submission there is a link there between the breach of duty and the profits that have resulted. Mm. What's, the it, it, what's the ratio of this case, Mr. Mason? That, that's a point that clearly arises with regard to it. it in terms of the actual decision it, it itself, part of it relates to the question of fiduciary relationships and the breach in relation there too. Um, but there's perhaps an even more stark definition uh, in relation to causation uh, in Swindler and others and Harrison and another at tab one in my Lord's uh, Bible. Uh, 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 are you going to tell me, Mr. Mason? Sorry, my Lord. In relation to the... More I don't. I don't think there's a single point, or not my interpretation of it. it, it it's with regard to, so far as is relevant here, in certain circumstances in relation to the existence of fiduciary relationships between the two main individuals within it, in circumstances where the court found that matters did arise and other circumstances where they didn't. But I think insofar as it is important in the context of this appeal, it's in relation to one, the existence of fiduciary relationships, and two, that link between breach and accounting for profits. Do we get any assistance from Lady Justice Arden at paragraph 67? is clearly right, um, but in the context of this case, it's not applicable because 
in terms of if a party did make a loss, I, I don't necessarily accept that they did, that party would have been healthcare to whom no duty was actually owed. But a question arises in this case, in fact, whether or not there was a loss insofar as they were concerned, because they could have never actually triggered the uh, discount provision. Uh, and the only question of loss here in my submission is in relation to the applicability or otherwise of the discount provision. Yeah. This is not a case where there's been an overvaluation of shares, people have been misled, etc. This is an entirely different situation. Insofar as the judge's findings are concerned, and what he did in terms of the valuation, the valuation of the company as he applied the various provisions. Well, you you say that the, the holdings paid a perfectly fair price for Mr. Parr's shares. Yes. That may well be right. But in this case, therefore, they don't sustain a loss. The yeah. only way in which they could sustain a loss is if the discount provisions could apply to them. Right. So they don't sustain a loss. Fine. So in, in my submission, absence of any loss, you then have to look at it from the position of profit so far as the appellant is concerned. Yes. In my submission, if one starts with the premise that the price was a fair commercial price, mm. there is no profit on his part as a result of that because even if holdings had been aware of his wrongdoings, they couldn't have invoked the discount. Well, it's down to holdings. It, 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 it's become apparent before uh, 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 transactions entered into the holdings with the picture. It was a pure conveyancing mechanism. I think the minute the wards had realised that uh, they were entitled to claim a, uh, a reduced price based on the back legal provisions, that's what would have happened. Dancing would have been organised accordingly. You can't simply take the benefit of it. This argument saying there was no benefit simply because some uh, rather convenient conveyancing mechanic was adopted at the end and stuck in a completely different uh, contemplation of facts, it seems to me. Anyway. Well, with respect to my lord, I don't think that that is the way in which the learned judge necessarily considered the position. Um, if one looks at his Judgment. Uh, he... no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure, uh, Mr. Mason. I, I entirely understand what is the significance of the fact, uh, as you say, that Holdings paid a the fair market value of Mr. Parr's shares. In, in those circumstances, in my submission, there is only a profit in relation to that transaction by reason of the discount provision applied. Yes. If the discount provision cannot apply as a matter of law, then in my submission there is no profit to disgorge. Right. So just to make sure I've understood this argument, the argument is that the profit arises out of a single transaction between Mr. Parr and Holdings. Holdings paid a fair price for Mr. Parr's shares. The discount provisions could not have applied in the circumstances of that transaction because Holdings was not entitled to the benefit of the discount provisions, therefore there is no profit. Right, well I understand that. 
So if there's no profit, there's nothing to disgorge. And in relation to holdings, is whether that's right. I do understand the submission. Well, simply in relation to the observation that you made in respect of and an inevitability that either health care or Mr. and Mrs. Ward would have triggered the, uh, the provision. It, it, it's not something that the learned judge immediately uh, sprung to. Could I invite you please to look at paragraph 178 of his judgment, page 70. Paragraph 178. Sorry, well, I'm 117. No, sorry, 178. Submission that Mr. and Mrs. Ward would have undoubtedly done so. I am not satisfied that they would. That is because it is, whilst it is now apparent that it would be in their financial interests to argue that they would have done, the question cannot be judged with the benefit of hindsight. And then he goes on to explain what he considers might have happened. But isn't he saying? They might not have done it immediately, but they would have done it. That is the likelihood, yes. But, but it, I, perhaps I was responding to the observation that it would have been done as a matter of course. In my submission, it's not as simple as that. There may have been issues. In fact, as to whether or not health care could have triggered it without breaking the legislation relating to companies purchasing their own shares. But in any event, beyond that consideration, The liability to disgorge to health care is in my submission <coughs> subject to the issue of causation <coughs> nexus of the transaction. What is a clear ratio? of a case in relation to Swindler, paragraph 1. But the appeals bundle on the first page is that the Court of Appeal held appears to be the ratio of the case in order to recover compensation for breach of fiduciary duty a plaintiff had to show that the loss had been caused by the defendant's breach of duty. Yeah, that's for compensation. Hmm. It is, my lord, yes. But in my submission, uh, there is an analogous position with regard to a breach of fiduciary that leads to an account of profit there still has to be some 
causal link between it. So what, the, the breach of fiduciary duty has caused the fiduciary to make a profit. Is that how you put it? No, that the actual breach itself is linked to the cause of profit. The breach, yes. say that again, the breach of fiduciary duty is linked. Is a, is a cause. Is a cause. Yeah. Of the profit. Isn't that what I just suggested to you? Sorry, my lord, I, I was simply putting it in my own right. words. So the, the submission is that the breach of a fidu the breach of fiduciary duty must be a cause of the profit. There has to be a causal link between them, yes. Well, do, do you want to change must be a cause? You want to say, want to say a causal link? What, what is the submission? That it must be a cause. Must be a cause. Yes. So, can I just read it back to you? The breach of fiduciary duty must be a cause of the profit. Yes, or loss, whichever. Yeah, fine. And for that proposition, you rely on Swindle and Harrison. As a starting point. Right, well, and it, what else do you rely on? If I could take, my lord, to some of the reasoning behind that, and in particular, in the judgment of Lord Justice Mummery, page 27, my lord. extent of liability and causation. Yeah. Clearly in the context of equitable compensation, but I submit it's an analogous position. It is, however, necessary to address the issue of causation. <coughs> yes. Then his Lordship goes on to say there is no equitable bypass of the need to establish causation. Right. Just before we move on, this, this, the passage to which you refer in answer to my question, it seems to me is in a section of the learned judgment, judgment dealing with the question of which accounts would have been used for the purposes of ascertaining a relevant price, not as to the question as to whether uh, uh, what would have happened if it would have been appreciated that there had been uh, a breach of fiduciary duty at an early stage, whether the bad legal provisions were targetable at all. That's what the point was being addressed at paragraph 178, is which were the appropriate accounts, as you can see quite clearly from uh, the head cross heading above paragraph 168 at page 68 of the judgment. My lord, there clearly is. It doesn't answer whether you've addressed the questions I put to you, and I'm rather disturbed that you put it that way to me. Well, my lord, I put it on that basis on the basis that the learned judge concluded that they wouldn't necessarily have triggered that provision as a matter of course immediately they discovered it. That is what I submit is a proper interpretation of the second sentence of paragraph 178. He then provides reference to the accounts in my submission in order to uh, provide reasoning for why he reached that conclusion. There was the, no the, obvious urgency, he says. Is, that's how, my Lord, I would submit that paragraph should be interpreted, is that he is answering the submission made by my learned friend, and then he is going on to justify by reference to those considerations why he adopts that approach.
my Lord, in further support of the submission of there needs to be some form of link, and clearly different words may be used between causation, nexus, or indeed a phrase used by my Lord himself in ultra frame um, at paragraph 1588 in volume 2. identifies governing principles in subparagraph 3 therein yeah. states that the profits for which an account is ordered must bear a reasonable relationship to the breach of duty proved say so, my lord I would submit that there is direct authority that there has to be some I yes. describe it as causal link. Well, if you just go up the same page, um, there's a quotation from Mr. Justice Lawrence Collins in CMS Dolphin and Simone. Uh, the end of the quotation, just above paragraph 1585, there must be some reasonable connection between the breach of duty and the profit. Well, let's raise the next point I was about yeah. to. So, in my submission, that there does have to be some causal link, mm. nexus, or as has been referred to by both my Lord and Mr. Justice Collins, as he then was, a reasonable connection. Yeah. And my Lord, what is entirely... I submit lacking within the learned judge's decision is any reasons with regard to that analysis. He simply refers to in paragraph 151 of page 65. submissions of Mr. Budsworth and references to the judgment of Lady Justice Arden and Lord Justice Jonathan Parker in Morad. Um, well, hasn't he dealt with Nexus at paragraphs 1, 4, 9 and 50? He says um, the obligation to disclose, there was an obligation to disclose which would have enabled, or in order to enable Keystone to decide how best to respond, which would have included his removal, not only as director, but also as shareholder pursuant to the articles which entitled Keystone to acquire his shares. In the circumstances, it cannot be said that there is no sufficient nexus between his breach and the consequences. Isn't that where the judge deals with that point? He does, but in, in my submission, that doesn't fully address the issue with regard to the so-called profit or loss. Well, you've already explained to us why you say there was no profit. So, but the, the, the link, if I can put it that way, the link between the breach and the price paid for the shares which is what you're on now, uh, is um, dealt with by the judge at 149-50. But in, in my submission, that, that is not 
the re reality of the <coughs> position, and, and that doesn't provide the link to the so-called prophet because of the distinction between what has occurred in terms of the transaction itself and it leads to the difficulty that in relation to that breach of duty that relates to health care but the profit relates to a transaction yeah, I mean, you've, made, you've made this point already yeah. I think uh, you've understood that and that's why in my submission the so-called causal link or nexus, whatever, doesn't apply in the circumstances indicated by the judge. Right. That's why I submit he erred. Right. So, so his real error is in one, four, nine, and fifty. Well, perhaps there are two. There are there are two main errors. One, he shouldn't have found there was a profit at all. So nothing to disgorge. And the second, there is no sufficient link between the, the breach of duty and the price paid. Yes, in terms of the transaction. Yeah. But they're effectively two separate matters. Yes, no, I understand that. And then, my lord, going on from that is the situation whereby in my submission, the judge recognises that on a true disgorgement principle, that it would apply to health care. But because of the scenario and, and the background that I've alluded to, that in reality, the transaction concerns holding. And that led to what I describe as an artificial situation of him ordering there being a disgorgement of profits to health care because that's the only basis it could be done. But then effectively making it by reference to the fact that they could hand those monies over to hold it. So, my lord, if it was, if there was that transactional link, causal link, there would have been no need to develop and introduce what I describe as an, an artificial mechanism. So my Lord, there could be no fiduciary relationship insofar as holdings were concerned. He was never a director of them. Well, the judge said found exactly that. He did. So that's not, you're not challenging any of that. You're, you're saying he was right about that. My Lord, I am. And I, I was about to develop my submissions into the alternative scenario. What alternative scenario? That my learned friend puts forward a vote. Well, let's, uh, we'll deal with that if we get to it. What do you want to say in support of your appeal? What more do you want to say in support of your appeal? So far as the account of profit is concerned, it is not, I submit, a traditional scenario where the person has 
actually made money or some other pecuniary advantage out of the transaction. The only way in which profit could in theory occur is related to the... Say that again? The only way in which profits could include what? I didn't hear. In theory, sorry my lord, could arise or occur. Right. Is by application of the provision within the articles of association yes. of the discount provision. submit it is far removed from a breach of fiduciary duty that actually gives rise to profit in the ordinary sense. Beyond that there is no link between the two. And beyond what? Between the fact that the breach of fiduciary duty relates to non disclosure of the existence of <coughs> breaches of fiduciary duty. and an entirely separate transaction with a party that had no rights in terms of that discount provision. Yeah. And what I submit is you can't merge those two entirely different strands together. And that is what the effect of the judgment is in this case. In my submission, what it is the effect of the judgment is is that the learned judge has sought to create a liability to a party where there is no fiduciary duty owed, i.e. to hold And secondly, where no discount provision applies by reason of the... Yeah, well, I think you've been over this bit. So finally, therefore, the learned judge sought to achieve something he couldn't do directly, because if he could, he would have simply found that there was a profit it related to a breach of fiduciary duty and that that should be profit should be paid to the person who has or is firstly a party to the transaction and to whom the profit or loss relates. My Lord, they, those are my submissions in relation to the appellant's grounds of appeal. Right. The much. other matters relate to Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mason. We'll retire for a few minutes just to see where we are.
Draws. Somebody better find this to Mason. Mr. Budworth, we need not trouble you. We are going to dismiss the appeal for reasons to be given in writing. Uh, we hope that uh, when you receive a draft judgment, you will be able to agree a form of order. Uh, but if you can't agree a form of order, please make submissions in writing, and we will deal with any consequential matters in the papers. Thank you for your.